You're listening to an interview taken from the Tonic Talk Show and Podcast, heard exclusively on Zoomer Radio. To download or listen to the original episode or other episodes of The Tonic, please visit thetonic.ca. Melanie Kushnarecki graduated from the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine in Toronto in 2009 and has a degree in Botany and Plant Physiology from the University of Ottawa. She has previous research experience in the Department of Pharmacy at the University of Toronto and in the Department of Epidemiology at University of Ottawa. Melanie was also a professional modern dancer before turning to naturopathic medicine and now enjoys the Argentine tango. And I have to be honest with you, I have no idea what the difference between tangos are, and that's a discussion for another day, but welcome to the show. Thank you, Jamie. Lovely to be here. And absolutely, I would love to talk about that on another show. So everybody is focused on, you know, the direct effect of COVID, right? We're all worried about getting it. We're all worried about what that could do to our body and keeping up our immunity. But I've identified an issue that I think we should all be focusing in on. And that is, you know, these are tough times and that creates stress. And that stress can be damaging to us too. And we really have to turn our minds to how we can sort of prevent that stress and help ourselves along. Do you agree with that? Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, as a naturopathic doctor, I've been seeing more and more of my patients coming to talk to me about the impacts of of stress, and particularly worry and anxiety, you know, worried about the illness, worried about their family members, or if any of their family members get sick, you know, how to cope. And so it's definitely been something that has been ongoing since the pandemic started, I would say. And it seems to be increasing, especially as there's more news media about what's going on with this pandemic. Yeah. And and that was my next point. You know, you're not a regular on the show, but I have real issues with the internet because I think people don't understand the difference between opinion and actual fact. And we're being inundated with advice that isn't necessarily helpful. Do you agree with that? Are you seeing that in your practice? Yeah, I mean, I feel, you know, in my general observation of things and what I see, you know, I think it's normal for people to kind of want to try to help themselves in the best way they can and help their loved ones. And so, you know, it's so easy to go to the Internet to, like, look up a bunch of stuff and try to find solutions on the Internet and try things out because, you know, they just want to feel better. And, there's, you know, firstly, I just want to say there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, and I think it's a very normal reaction for people to do that. But what often happens is that the information can sometimes be interpreted as an opinion in that article, and it could be confusing for someone who doesn't know, you know, all the details about, you know, either the medical point of view or the research and the science. And so it can sometimes be misleading. And yeah, absolutely. It's sometimes hard to distinguish between opinion and facts and research And so I definitely do get that in my practice, yes. So let's talk a bit about your practice and sort of, you know, for those who don't understand where a naturopathic doctor comes from, can you explain a little bit about your training and your perspective on health? Sure. So a naturopathic doctor typically have an undergraduate degree, and so it could be in uh, science or it could also be in arts. And then the training usually entails four years of a naturopathic college, which they receive extensive training in you know, medical sciences such as physiology, pathology, microbiology, diagnosis, laboratory, all kinds of gamuts and markers and things like that. And then we have a year of residency program where we get to see patients in our residency. And then for the most part, naturopathic doctors will then go on to open their own private practice, or some of them might choose to work in a hospital in our community setting, And so there are more naturopathic doctors being integrated within our community, let's say. And we have an extensive medical background, but we also have a very good base in the traditional medicines and how to incorporate traditional medicines into someone's health care plan. Right. So philosophically, you're coming from a slightly different place than an allopathic doctor or what a traditional MD would be, right? Yeah. And first, I'd like to say that there, I mean, there's definitely some similarities sure. that naturopathic doctors will, you know, want to first do no harm, like any healthcare provider. Sure. We want to prevent, we want to educate. But where the difference lies, particularly, is in the way the medicines work. So a naturopathic medicines or natural medicines, what have you, you know, are looked at as a more holistic type of medicine versus, you know, pharmaceutical or other compounds and medications that are a a very reductionistic, isolated compound. And so the difference, or when we talk about, you know, 
conventional medicine versus naturopathic medicine, it's not so much in the treatment or the, the, the care plan. It's in the way the medicines themselves work. Okay. In the sense of, like, conventional medicine is more reductionistic, naturopathic medicines are more holistic. And so oftentimes, you know, we, we talk a lot about energy, the energy of plants or medicines or just the energy of, of people. And so oftentimes our entire, like, w- what the goal of a naturopathic medicine doctor is treatment and outcome-based, but it's also on energy and quality of life. And so it's a generalized holistic view versus a, you know, reductionistic view. And quite honestly, both have their place in someone's care. Right. And so like in layman's terms, you're treating the whole person, right? When you talk about holistically, you're looking at their overall health and how it may interact with the symptomology might be that presents. Whereas an allopathic approach might be to deal with those symptoms directly and succinctly. But there may be, and and this seems to be a key difference in my experience, is it's the side effects which sort of, you know, are problematic from a holistic approach, you're trying to avoid those side effects, yeah? Exactly, exactly. So I think the nature of of natural products and natural medicines is that it's a very gentle medicine and there's fundamental differences. So in natural health products, for example, or, or herbal medicines, there's many different chemical compounds in one single herb, you know, many different active compounds. And it's believed, and there's even, you know, scientific literature on this, that it's the synergy of these compounds that exert this holistic effect and can have side benefit of mitigating side effects versus, you know, a medical drug, which is primarily an isolated compound, and it's targeted to affect a particular function in the body. But because of that, there seems to be more prevalence of side effects. And so that's sort of the fundamental difference is like we're trying to mitigate the side effects and to improve the quality of life during somebody's, you know, treatment or care or what have you. Okay. Let's bring the focus back to stress and mm-hmm. sort of this comfort that everybody seems to be feeling and talk about how a naturopath, you know, would deal. Like what sort of compounds and, and ingredients would you be looking at to help people? Sure. So, you know, this is where art of a naturopathic doctor really shines is that we would we take the time with our patients to get to know them. Sure. And to kind of sit, to kind of determine together what could be, you know, the important root cause or what could be the contributing factors. Of course, that's very idealistic, and sometimes we just can't fix the root cause. Or, you know, it's very difficult, like in the case of this pandemic, for example. Right. And so oftentimes, you know, we, we work together to first find the most simplest solution. So whether it's diet or lifestyle, I mean, you hear a lot right now on self-care about, you know, sleeping well, meditating, sure. ensuring you're eating well. Yep. But sometimes you just can't do it all. I right. mean, the self-care is, can be overwhelming. And a lot of us, you know, we you know, still have to maintain jobs and families. And so a naturopathic doctor will then devise, you know, according to you, they'll meet you where you're at and find out what would be the best type of natural product out there, because there's just so many, depending right. on your circumstances. And so, for example, let's say, you know, you're getting a lot of worry and anxiety ongoing, and you just happen to be somebody who has like a not a very good diet, eat on the run, and, you know, we find out that you don't eat fish either or or any omega-3s as an example. Sure. Instead of like reaching for something that's like calming or that's going to ease anxiety, either medication like, you know, Ativan or Valium or even some of the natural health products, Maybe you'd want to first consider incorporating a fish oil or some EPA, which is a compound of fish oil, or some omega-3s. And so, you know, it's not quick acting, but it's long term. And so what we would do then is say, okay, let's see about incorporating some, you know, omega-3s to help with stress. There's research that demonstrates that the omega-3 can actually impact the uh, HPA axis or the stress response. Mm -hmm. Also, it can improve memory. There's there's all kinds of effects. And then you would incorporate that with, let's say, a short-acting herb that can just kind of get you through in the short term. And so we kind of want to do a comprehensive look at addressing the root cause, but then also how to manage your symptoms acutely in the moment. And, you know, before trying some of the more heavy-duty drugs that could potentially have interactions or side effects. So that would be for like a healthy person, for example. Okay, so you, you've explained a bit about omega fatty acids and, you know, what else might be in your lexicon? What mm-hmm. else have you seen that works with your clients or, or that you've read about that might help somebody who's suffering from stress? 
Yeah, so there's a few favorites. Sure. Based on the research and also based on my clinical experience. And so, you know, one of them could be L-theanine, which is the chemical compound, the active constituent of uh, green tea. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is where it's always individualized. And so sure. what I find L-theanine works really well for is in circumstances where, you know, for mental acuity, for performing tasks at work, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. It also can help, like, the research shows its mechanism is to slow the alpha wave activity of the brain. And it has very minimal interactions. It doesn't have any, you know, effect on neurotransmitter. And so it's a safe compound to try, you know, if, if let's say, you're somebody in, who is experiencing stress and you're having difficulty concentrating at work. Okay. The same thing can be seen with GABA, which this is a bit more interesting because, you know, it was believed that GABA taken orally had no effects because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier as a supplement or taken by mouth. What they discovered recently is that there was a contradiction because they said mechanistically it doesn't make sense, you shouldn't feel relaxed, but then they did all these studies and they discovered that people actually benefited from taking oral GABA. And so they're like, what's going on? Was it a placebo effect or was it real? They did the studies and it was found to be better than placebo. So that was kind of confirmed. But what the theory is, which it's still not confirmed fact, but the theory is that we had GABA receptors in our intestinal, in our intestines. Right. And the GABA can bind to those receptors in the intestines and have a stimulatory effect on the vagus nerve. Right. The vagus nerve. Yeah. I I mean, that is scientifically proven that there is a stomach brain connection though, right? Exactly. Yes. But what we're discovering now is that that's how this GABA can potential can function. And in fact, we also know that probiotics can produce GABA. Oh, And so okay. that could be another way in which, you know, there's, I'm not sure if you know, but there's a lot of studies now on the gut-brain connection for mental health yep. and how probiotics can help in that regard as well. And so that's one theory, right, is that, these, you know, this GABA theory, which is like a GABA acts as a neuroinhibitory. It stops, it kind of calms everything down. Hmm. Yeah, so those are two examples. <laughs> okay, what, well, what else? This is interesting. Where are we going with this? What else would you recommend? So another one of my favorites is lavender oil. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, most of us know lavender oil as an aromatherapy. Yep. We smell it and some people don't like it. Other people like it. Yep. But now they have studied on its effects taken orally. So as a pill in a gel cap, actually. I was going to say, I didn't know that a lavender was edible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's safe. And it's like one of the most, well, there's a ton of research now on herbal medicine. It gets sure. really excited. But what's great about lavender is that, first of all, there was a meta-analysis that included around 65 randomized controlled trials. 54 found that the lavender was better than placebo at reducing anxiety and stress. Huh. And so it's a very, very well-researched herb. And the other thing is that, it's, I mean, the, the mechanism isn't 100% known yet, but they've done pharmacokinetic, which means they wanted to see what it would do pharmacologically in the right. body. yeah. And it didn't seem to inhibit or induce any of the major pathways that drugs are typically metabolized by. And so it's always better to still confirm with either a pharmacist or an MD or somebody before starting anything if you're on meds. But it seems as though it's less worrisome in terms of interaction. So there's no contraindications that you read about. That's right. Exactly. And it's very, very good safety profile. I think the only side effect was like burping up lavender. Okay. Well, (laughs) that's for another day. We have time time for one last mystery ingredient. Where would you like to go last? I think another herb that often we don't think about, but is something that has been extensively studied is uh, saffron. Mm -hmm. And so saffron is, it's a spice. It's cultivated from the stigma of the crocus plant. Yes. And it was discovered in Iran, similar to lavender. Both of these herbs were discovered in Iran through studies there. And similarly to lavender, a lot of RCTs now on its effects, both as an adjuvant, meaning together with medications, but also as a, like by itself to relieve symptoms associated with, with stress. And so that's another one to look out for. I mean, it's just, it's so interesting. And, you know, they have it as a, you know, the supplement, but you can also, it's an expensive spice, but it you is, don't need much of it. It's the most expensive spice in the world. 
Yeah. <laughs> it is, literally. It's so <laughs> It is. But that's okay. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Will you come back again and talk herbs with us? Absolutely. I would love to. Thank you, Jamie.